I'm Allison Singer with the Autism Science Foundation, and we're here today with Dr. Ted Brodkin. He is a faculty member at the Center for Autism Research at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and he's Assistant Professor of Psychiatry at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for inviting me. Dr. Brocken, I'm so excited to talk to you about the work you're doing regarding sociability because that is really one of the core features of autism and it's been one of the trickiest for us to really understand and get a handle on. So maybe we can start by explaining why sociability is important and how you're studying sociability. Sure, sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so yes, sociability is really a primary interest for my research program and um, the way I define sociability usually is basically a tendency to seek social interaction. Um, and when autism was really first described back in 1943 by Leo Conner, um, this issue of sociability he identified as, as really a core feature, um, a kind of, he described it I think as autistic aloneness or a disturbance of um, affective contact or emotional contact between the individual with an autism spectrum disorder and others. And so, <clears throat> Um, you know, what we observe is that kids with autism spectrum disorders seem to be less inclined to interact with others or perhaps less interested in interacting with others. And really the $64,000 question is why? What is it that um, is leading to that? You know, is it that um, social interactions or other people are somehow less salient um, to kids with autism or um, social interactions are somehow less pleasurable and rewarding? Is it that interacting with others are, is more um, anxiety producing in some way? Um, is it that the signals we, that individuals with autism get about the social world are not being processed in the way most people process them at a sensory level and therefore the signals are kind of scrambled up? Um, or is it some combination of those? And so I think that's for the field of autism research in general, um, that's a really, really important question. And so we've started to study this in, in mouse models. Now how do you study sociability in mice, particularly when the way mice exhi exhibit sociability is through sniffing each other, whereas humans, the predominant senses are really visual and auditory. So is, is the mouse a good model for sociability? That's a great point. I mean, I think that when you know when we study mice, we always have to be very aware of those um, glaringly <laughs> clear species differences and be sort of cautious in extrapolating between species in that way. Um, as you said, clearly the the initial sensory input that mice rely upon for about the social world is primarily smelling or olfaction, and they get a lot of cues um, about each other by sniffing. Whereas people, you know, we tend to look at each other more and uh, talk to each other, so it's mostly visual and auditory. Um, the interesting thing, though, is that if you look just sort of downstream, so to speak, in the brain from that initial sensory input, both in humans and in mice, and in primates for that matter, a lot of that sensory input goes directly to a system of the brain that's sometimes called the limbic system, or certain parts of the limbic system like the amygdala and so on. And, these systems in the brain um, give that sensory information about the social world emotional and motivational significance. So, um, you know, is what I'm perceiving interesting? Is it rewarding? Is it something worth approaching and finding more about? Or is it threatening? Is it anxiety producing? Is it something I should avoid or that could be dangerous? Um, and you know, so, so whether it's sniffing in the mouse, that olfactory information really goes straight to the amygdala and to the limbic system. And in humans, when people look at each other, um, the visual information about faces and facial expressions and so on goes initially to the occipital cortex, but from there very quickly to the amygdala, which imbues it with this kind of emotional and motivational significance. So I think that um, despite the sensory, the initial sensory input differences, um, there, there probably are some commonalities in terms of the way the brain processes things in terms of emotional and motivational significance. And I think um, to, a, to a pretty good extent that's been conserved across evolution. It's a kind of an ancient primitive part of, part of the brain that um, gives sensory information its kind of emotional and motivational significance. So one of the social issues that 
humans, kids with autism sometimes uh, come up against is aggressive behavior. And it, it tends to be this type of negative behavior that keeps them out of school or makes it hard for them to stay in, in programs. And I know you've done some work looking at aggressive behavior in mice. Right. Um, does that translate? Can you really look at aggressive behavior in mice? And, and how is that done? Um, well, we can. Um, aggression is a kind of a naturally occurring behavior um, in mice and, and, and really in humans as well. Um, as you point out, in, in autism spectrum disorder, sometimes some of the aggressive impulses become dysregulated and it can become a problem either in a school setting or a work setting or even at home. Um, and it can really become a major issue. And I think that. Um, you know, if you speak to families who are, that are affected by, an autis by autism spectrum disorders, um, they are often aware of this. It's not in every child with autism, but this can often be a major issue. I think as far as the general public goes, I think people may be less aware of that um, if they're not personally affected by, by autism, but it can be a huge issue. And so, yes, we, we have started to study this in mice. Um, what we've studied is natural variations among mouse strains in aggressive behaviors, and we um, have done some genetic mapping studies in which we've mapped regions of the genome that have been linked with aggression and tried to identify gene variants within those regions um, that contribute to, to aggression. Now, um, this, this area of sort of the genetics of aggression can be kind of a touchy and sensitive subject and there's worries about, you know, are we, is our behavior really determined by genes and so on. Um, I think it's clear, it's absolutely clear both from human studies and from mouse studies that we, neither mice nor humans are automatons that are completely driven in their behavior by a single gene. Um, but a whole host of different genes and gene variants together with environmental factors and experience and development can shape behavior. And so we've used the genetics as really a kind of an entry point to get some insight into the neurobiology of aggressive behaviors. And also we do this with sociability. And, the ultimate goal is to better understand it, and if we can understand it better, then maybe we can come up with better treatments, because right now, the treatments that are available are really um, inadequate, I would say, both for dysregulation of aggressive behaviors and also for um, difficulties with sociability. Well, let's talk about treatments. Are we, because as you say, ultimately the goal of the mouse modeling is to have biologically based treatments. Um, are we moving, based on your research, to finding new treatments for aggressive behavior and to improve sociability? Um, I think we are. I'm, I don't know that if I, I would be as so bold as to say that my research alone has gotten us there yet. Um, that's, that's the ultimate hope. Um, but I think that there are other examples, even in conditions related to autism spectrum disorders. For example, if you look at um, the field of Fragile X research, um, you know, a lot had been learned uh, or has been learned through basic research um, on the mechanism of action of this gene, the FMR1 gene that's responsible for Fragile X, and how that gene relates to um, excitatory neurotransmitter signaling, glutamate signaling in the brain. And really not much had been, I mean, the, uh, the gene for Fragile X, FMR1, FMR1 was identified. Not all that much was known about it, but as more basic research was done, it was realized that this was related to glutamate signaling, and now, some drugs have been developed, um, antagonists to this mGluR5 receptor, uh, that seem to um, ameliorate some symptoms of Fragile X in animal models, and now this is being tested in, in humans. Um, I don't know that this gets at sociability or aggressive behavior that we've been talking about specifically, but at least to some other symptoms of Fragile X. So that's the hope, is that by working together, by direct human studies, together with um, animal model and basic research studies interacting with each other that we can really advance the detailed understanding of the biology and then come to better treatments. And when you are making mouse models, as you, as you said yeah. earlier, we are not solely driven by our genes and neither are the mice. So right. how do you account for environmental influences when you're making mouse models of sociability? Um, that's a great question. Um, well. There's many ways uh, to look at that. One, I mean, one issue is that you have to be aware of this. Like, of course, when you study humans, there's all kinds of genetic diversity, unless you're really studying identical twins um, that, that share you know, their whole genome sequence. But generally, with humans, there's a lot of genetic diversity. Now, the, one of the advantages of mice is that you can study 
a really completely genetically homogeneous group of mice. You can get 10 or 20 or 100 mice that are all genetically identical to each other like twins and study their behavior. And one of the things we find is that um, although on average the behavior of a group like that tends to be similar, there's still quite a bit of variability among those genetically identical mice in their behavior, which, which proves even for mice that environment um, plays a big role. Um, so it really depends on what the goal is in your research, um, whether it's, you know, whether, whether you are um, aimed at identifying genes or environmental factors or the interaction between the two. And sometimes in studies of animal models, to try to increase the, the power of your methodology, people try to hold one or the other factor constant. So in other words, if you're interested in environment, you can study genetically identical mice and, and vary the environment. Or you can try to keep environmental factors similar and then change a gene or something like that. Well, again, I want to thank you. I know many parents are really looking forward to reading the outcome of this research. And the social issues really present uh, a lot of challenges for our kids. So I want to thank you for joining us today. And again, we look forward to reading the outcome of your research. Thanks very much.